One of the fantastically lucky things um, for us as a college is that um, three utterly illustrious uh, professors of astrophysics went to our college. Um, Jocelyn, who you heard of before, and Hira Hiranya Pires, trying to get pronunciation correct, Dorothy, who is the new Cambridge professor of astrophysics. And I think you're so new that we should give you a round of applause. <laughs> And Hiranya has also uh, rejoined the college as a fellow. I suppose that's a bit like being at, at school and then becoming the headmistress. Um, I think it's a bit more like coming back to your parents' house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but I will get over it. <laughs> and you are the, now you're the 1909 professor. Mm -hmm. And how many women have been in that role since 1909? Zero. Ah, oh, but now one. <laughs> uh, fantastic. And Catherine Blundell is professor of astrophysics at um, Oxford, but also professor of astronomy at London. Gresham. Gresham. Gresham professor. I have to say Gresham professor. And... Um, Apparently, Christopher Wren used to do that job. And um, how many women have had that job? I think I'm number three. Number three? Wow, that's... Um, and you... But, it, but it's, it's a, a role that's existed for about three centuries, so I think the, um, <laughs> the numbers aren't that different no. for uh, yeah. Hiranya and myself. <laughs> so do you get double pay? Uh, uh, that would be a no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you see, if you were a bloke... <laughs> you get double pay. So, um, uh, first of all, we're going to um, just see two very, very short films, and then we're going to talk about astrophysics, my specialist subject, obviously, <laughs> and then we're, we're going to talk about some of the very serious issues um, involved in our conference today, but I would say the universe is pretty serious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as well, so that's two serious subjects. So, Catherine, um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your video, or do you want us to just watch it and be surprised? Perhaps I could make a few mm -hmm. introductory comments. Yes. So, uh, the short video that you're about to see, um, I hope, encapsulates two themes of something that takes up quite a lot of my time my research in astrophysics. So I love to study um, the activity going on in our galaxy. The galaxy is teeming with activity, playing out the laws of physics in all their violent and energetic ways. Whether it's stars exploding or merging, doing a close fly past, or squirting out powerful relativistic material, I love to study anything that changes. I don't know if that's a commentary on the fact I have a short attention span, but I love to study uh, things that change. When I was a kid, I really wanted to be a detective. That, I thought, was just the best thing in life. Grappling with mysteries, trying to ask good questions to elucidate what had really been going on on the basis of very sparse data. But I was discouraged from doing that um, by my brother, who said, you, you mustn't do that, you can't do that. Girls shouldn't do that because women detectives, women police um, officers get attacked. Don't do that, do something else. So I decided to go into physics, but research encapsulates the same business of asking good questions in order to make progress. I'm sure, Haranya, I can see her nodding in my peripheral vision. And, and that's such good fun. But I don't just do research. I'm conscious of the privileges that I have. Like uh, Irene, our vice chancellor earlier, I had that most precious privilege in life, a supportive home environment in which, in which to flourish. When I was a kid, my brother and I were told things like, there's no such word as can't. And so that was very much a, you have to try this. Don't say you can't before you've even tried it. So that was the backdrop I have had. And the perspective that I have 
on the fact that I don't want to be the only beneficiary of the work that I do. So I didn't want my research programme to only benefit myself and those in a very close group of collaborators. I mentioned I like to study things that change. Contrary to the kind of astrophysics and cosmology that we'll hear about from Haranya presently, I like to study things on rather more rapid uh, timescales, sub 24 hour timescales. And if you want to do that in astronomy, then you need to deal with the fact that daylight keeps popping up, which means you can't do optical astronomy. Daylight is terrific for photosynthesis, of course, you know, shout out to biologists, but it's no good for optical astronomy. And so what I did was to set up telescopes around the world, separated in longitude, so there's always one of them in darkness. But here's the bit where other people come in. The telescopes are hosted by residential schools. Now, don't think of posh English boarding schools, residential schools. You'll see one of them, my one in rural southern India, in a few moments. The spirit of what I'm doing is about making things work for everyone, much like our vice chancellors are doing, not just for our universities, but for the world stage beyond. And so the paradigm is that before local bedtime, the students are free to play with the telescopes. And I deliberately use that verb, because if you say to them, I want you to have a formal learning experience and I'm going to be marking your outcomes, that can be a tad quenching, I feel. But if you say, I want you to play, you're capitalising on the fact that when teenagers are having fun, they're in a place where they can learn. And the wonderful night sky is a terrific place uh, from which to do that. So... That was thrilling. <laughs> <laughs> um. But I think you'd have been a good detective, too. I think so. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> um, so, um, let's play the film, please. The Global Jet Watch has five telescopes around the world, separated in longitude, with at least one always in darkness. Having round-the-world observatories allows round-the-clock gathering of astrophysics data. This is one of five such observatories distributed around the world. We have one in Chile, we have one in South Africa, we have two in Australia, one at each end. We follow the behaviour of exotic, energetic and evolving objects in our night sky as they change over hours and days. I lead a research team in Oxford that studies changing objects in our galaxy. Nova explosions, massive stars orbiting one another, and microquasars, systems with a black hole at their centre, ripping apart other stars. Each global jet watch observatory contains a telescope with a half metre primary mirror to collect the light. After collecting the light, we deconstruct it to understand the astrophysical secrets within. We split the light up with an instrument called a spectrograph. A special grating splits up starlight into a spectrum, in much the same way that raindrops in a cloud split up sunlight into a rainbow. Once we have a spectrum, we can study the dynamics, the astrochemistry, or the energetic explosions that we are investigating. Cutting-edge astrophysics research is just one aspect of the Global Jet Watch program. Our observatories were built in schools so that students can play with the telescopes and get excited about space science. I love astronomy because everything cannot be seen by a human naked eye and with the help of telescope I can fulfill my wishes by seeing the celestial bodies. Once the students are in bed, the Global Jet Watch telescopes collect astrophysical data for our research programs back in Oxford. An important legacy of the Global Jet Watch is engaging young people in science, especially in the developing world, especially girls. My parents are basically farmers. 
they don't know what this uh, space then scientists after com coming here i inspired from all these telescopes and i inspired from you that i want to become scientist we're encouraging the next generation of globally astute scientifically literate young people trapezium stars are hard but causing it to glow from them this material is Well, doubly inspiring. That was fantastic. Um, now, Hiranya, um, before we see your film, um, would you just like to tell us a little bit about your journey into the universe and beyond? Yes, so I'm a cosmologist, so I study the universe, um, its origin, where everything came from, how it's evolving, what does it contain, and what is its fate? And those are like really big questions. It's really audacious to, to ask them. And amazingly, in the past couple of decades, you know, we actually have data to try to answer some of those questions and then reveal new mysteries that we have to solve. So just like Catherine said, you know, I think the universe is a detective story. And as astronomers, we are basically detectives. We can't make universes in the laboratory yet. <laughs> so um, we have to look at the clues that nature has, has left us. And those clues are there in the sky. And one of the things that makes this detective story possible is that light has a speed limit. So when you look out into the distant universe, you see things as they were in the past. So looking out into distant space is like a time machine. And um, for me, a galaxy is a point. <laughs> in my universe, galaxy, there are hundreds of millions or even billions of galaxies. And um, you know, we can see them evolving over cosmic time. So how was I attracted into this? Um, even when I was a little kid, I can't actually remember when I started to wonder about the universe and the night sky. And the very, very big ideas that I heard about, for example, from Carl Sagan, about um, the time and, 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 and the span of the, the history of the universe and humanity's place within it really captured me. And I was very, very lucky to have a very supportive um, uh, you know, family environment and, and parents. And my mother was the first, um, one of the first civil engineers in, in Sri Lanka. So I had a, a role model at home. And I was never you know, brought up to think that girls can't do this or that. I was you know, taught to think that if I tried, I could do anything. And so um, none of those issues impacted my love of finding things out. I think it is one of the most fun things you can do to find things out. And if you keep that spirit with you, it, it, it's, it, it is like playing. I feel like we have the best jobs in the world because we get to do something that's really fun that we would e even do for free and we get paid to do it. <laughs> and we get to, to work with wonderful people across the planet and we get to work with the brilliant minds of young people that we see flourishing as they learn and they grow and they go on into their own selves and, and their own lives. And it's an it's a, a incredibly rewarding profession. Um, if you play so, my video... Yes, so, <laughs> and Hiranya is going to talk us through the universe. Yeah, yeah, so uh, you will, this is an animation, um, if, if it will play. So uh, this is actually uh, an animation of a spacecraft that I uh, worked with the data from when I was um, in my PhD. If you bring the lights down a bit, it might play a bit better. So it's basically going further and further away from the Earth. And you know the universe starts to look very different when you look into the distant reaches. And eventually, it looks quite dark. And then there is a explosion of light, which is the afterglow of the Big Bang. So essentially, by looking in different wavelengths of light, starting from the millimeter to the optical through to x-rays, uh, through very high energy photons, you can see different views of the universe. 
And these days, um, we cannot just see the universe, but we can sense it. Because in 2015, we detected gravitational waves that were emanating from uh, distant mergers of black holes. And so we can now sense the universe, and we can see the universe. And we can track how it, it evolved over uh, its history. So we have so much data. And um, the, the telescope that I'm most excited about is a project that I've been working towards for um, about a decade. And it's called the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. Uh, Vera Rubin is a pioneer of, of dark matter. This facility, which is a billion dollar facility, um, is uh, the first major observatory named after a woman. It's taken quite a lot of time. And it's going to do something amazing. Um, it basically will image the entire southern sky roughly every three days and do that for 10 years. And so we will make our first movie of the universe. So we will not only see the entire universe evolving over cosmic time, but we will also detect the sort of phenomena that, that Catherine is very interested in, um, explosions, very extreme violent events uh, of, of stars um, dying and uh, black holes merging, and uh, compact objects like neutron stars merging, and uh, emanating very, very powerful uh, radiation that we can detect. And so um, that will be an amazing facility to, to uh, work with. And the data from this is such a fire hose that you know, it needs very, very large teams. So there are 23 countries involved in the Vera Rubin Observatory. Um, and we work in very large collaborations, um, like thousands of people. And um, so teamwork is very important. Um, lone scientists, I personally haven't even really encountered these lone heroes of science in my entire career. I think that's an old story. History. It is history. That's not what uh, my field is like. I don't think it's what your field is like. And, and it's really fun to work with people from uh, all over the planet, um, speaking different languages, you know, uh, and we can still somehow communicate through the language of science and bring our uh, knowledge together into one place to answer very, very big questions. So. Fabulous. Thank you very much. And now I want to bring us down to earth. <laughs> so, Hiranya, you told us that um, in Sri Lanka, not just because of your family, but I know that you, you hadn't even heard that girls were not good at maths and science. It, 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 as I mentioned earlier, in most of the world, it's just not a thing. Mm -hmm. um, so how did you discover um, this bizarre stereotype? Uh, it's when I, uh, I came to the UK at the age of 16, and I went to a mixed school for the first time, and suddenly I started getting hints that I wasn't supposed to be enjoying maths and physics, and I was suddenly, for the first time, a minority uh, in the class, um, especially in, in further maths, I remember. Um, and it, I'm one of those people that I, I have quite a thick skin. I don't really notice these kinds of slights and what people say doesn't really matter to me so much, but I did notice it. Um, and one particular memory I have is uh, m my maths teacher in, in school was um, amazing, um, and he had, had noticed that I was good at maths. He was giving me university-level textbooks to work through, and I was chapters and chapters ahead of the rest of the class. And the boys actually complained hmm. to the teacher that I was doing problems ahead of them. Oof. And he said, well, you know, if you want, you can, you can do the same problem she is. <laughs> so anyway, so that was one example of, of, of something that happened that made me think, oh, some people think that girls can't do maths. And then when you came to university, you actually came here um, to do computer science in, initially. That's right. And um, what was that experience like of being at Cambridge at that time as a woman who was first in computer science and then in physics, were there many of you? Mm -hmm. 
Uh, there were very few of us. Um, so I, I actually, it, it was two years off. I, I should say this because it really matters to me. Uh, New Hall at, at that time admitted me, but I couldn't actually go to university for two years because I couldn't afford it really. And the college actually kept the place open for me. So I started in computer science. And um, even though I, I really liked astronomy and, and so on, I didn't realize you could have a career in that. So computer science was something I enjoyed and I was going to be able to have a, a professional life. Um, and uh, it was a quite isolating experience, I would say. Um, there weren't that many um, girls studying computer science. I think there was one other girl in my class. Um, and there was one uh, woman professor who was my director of studies that first year. And, um, but, but then after, uh, after that, I, I switched to, to physics. And um, I started feeling like um, that was much more enjoyable in some sense. And particularly a research experience I had in my second year um, at the Jet, Jet Propulsion Laboratory um, in California made me think that I wanted to do astronomy. I thought those people had the best jobs in the world. And I had a sense of belonging there. And I think that's so important that and everybody should feel like they belong in a space. Um, and I had that there. So that's when I realized uh, this is what I want to do with my life. And did you have that experience at all at school of and of, I don't know, boys or anybody thinking that they were a bit annoyed that you were so clever. And then when you were went to university, how did you find being in a minority? Because we were hearing a lot yesterday from um, schoolgirls and, and university students about what it feels like to be in a small minority. I think at school things weren't so bad because, um, you know, if you were good at physics and maths and not so good at French, then, you know, that there was a certain collegiality at school. It was, um, it wasn't a posh school at all. It was a comprehensive school, not so far from Birmingham, but it was, it was a collegial place. Um, university had its slightly tiresome guys who <laughs> were pretty tedious. Um, but I think what's really important to carry you through those times, and those times will always happen, um, is to remember you're not just a brain on two legs. Um, it's so important that you have a broad friendship base that includes people outside of science um, so that your perspectives don't become too narrow and too tunnel visioned. It's really important to keep on with doing whatever makes you, you, whether it's badminton or trampolining or your church or your choir or your orchestra or growing marigolds. It, it doesn't matter what you do, but if, if all you are is a brain on two legs and then some tedious guy says something absolutely unacceptable and reasonable and unreasonable and goodness, did that person really say that out loud in 2023? When those things happen and they will, you can ride those storms much more easily if your entire world is not just the equations you're trying to solve or the grant proposal you're trying to write or the paper you're trying to finish. We've got with us um, uh, brilliant school students from Mulberry and each of them really interested in uh, coming to university and doing different science subjects. Um, I wonder what you would each say to them. You've sort of said it in a way about, yes, you might be in a minority if you, say, choose physics, but how do you, how, how do you get through it? I was very struck by something Hiranya said a moment ago about the importance of belonging. If you belong to a community or to part of a society or something, then that's absolutely fine, even if numerically you're in a minority. 
you need to anchor what you do with really good friends. Um, and so tempered with the fact that, you know, yes, absolutely go for physics and maths and zoology and pharmacology and whatever is you, you find ignites your curiosity. Yes, do all those things, but be really careful not to be put off just because it's hard. Do it anyway and persevere because the sense of how rewarding it is when you do something hard and when you stick with it and when you chew at it from different angles, it is fantastically rewarding. And a number of our current students say who are in subjects where they're very much in a minority that actually one of the things, and I'm not saying everybody should be in a women's college and I'm not just selling um, Murray Edwards to you, but actually um, it's nice to come back at night to a place where there are men, of course, but um, you, you're, they're, they're in a majority. They, they say it's rather restful. D did you find that at all, Hiranya? Uh, I did, actually, because um, the, the classes I was in were very male-dominated, and uh, there were some tedious guys, but most of them were perfectly nice. But it, it, it is, you know, you stick out like a sore thumb, right? And um, I remember that coming back to college, and uh, I had very, I was very geeky. I had very geeky friends, <laughs> and we would like, um, you know, actually there was nobody had the, their own TV at the time, so we had to watch TV um, in the. Uh, I guess I can't remember the name of the the Jesse room. Arf. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And we, um, you probably don't even know what this is, but we used to watch Babylon 5 <laughs> together. It's a science fiction show from the 90s. Um, I, I, I remember that was a very nice feeling of camaraderie. And um, I, I think that, you know, it, it did have a sort of, uh, there were normal people around, but also there were people that were strange like I was. And, uh, Yes, I, I was um, struck by that comment about, you know, it's okay to be strange, right? The, the advice I would give to young people is find your own path. You know, find what you're passionate about and then do that. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I think it's actually really rewarding to do the hard things. Mm. And it's okay to try and fail and try again. Um, yeah, if you don't try, you'll never know what's possible. Thank you. And when each of you look today at the fact that um, only 23% of those taking A-level physics are women, um, have you any thoughts about uh, what can be done uh, and what the root of that problem is? I, I, I know you're concerned about the lack of teachers. Very much so. Um, not just the lack of teachers, but the expectations on teachers who have to teach maths and physics who have no background in maths or physics. Mm -hmm. That's an extraordinarily hard position for teachers to be put in. And yet it's happening to thousands across the UK now. So I had, um, uh, I, I was uh, involved in a, a course, a conference, to sort of give uh, teachers who have to teach physics but don't have a background in physics, to give them a boost. It was a weekend course or something at one of the Oxford colleges. And I remember speaking with, I had three students next to me at the dinner. And of course, people often open up over dinners, and so that's a very um, good thing to participate in, in general. And I was struck by... Uh, three of the different things that um, people said there. So one, one lady said, and I think she, her training was in biology. She said, I have to have three gins before I can go into a physics lesson because I cannot stand the stress of trying to teach teenagers something they know perfectly well, I don't really understand and I don't know what I'm talking about. And still another one said, um, I can only ever teach um, the girls in my class uh, for about 20 minutes. So this teacher had a background in uh, archaeology. Um, I can only ever teach 20 minutes of a double lesson because I can't upload into my brain more than 20 minutes worth of material before I just forget the understanding, the content, what the arguments are, what the issues are. So after that, 
I just let the girls get out their hair straighteners and their makeup bags. So if that's the provision of teaching in mm. a great many schools in the UK, it's no wonder that there aren't enough uh, girls choosing to follow science as a career. It's because the teaching opportunities aren't really there. Have, have you got thoughts about that? Hiramia? It's not something I have a great deal of expertise in, so I probably shouldn't just comment because I, it wouldn't be from an informed perspective. Um, because my, my experience of, you know, uh, education was quite different. You had good teaching. I had good and, teaching. And we've heard that yes. um, yesterday and today from so many people. That, yes. Uh, and a really informed, inspiring teacher. Mm -hmm. Again and again, women have said it was because I had a really inspiring teacher. That's why I, uh, I did this. Yeah. And then um, at university, um, we discussed in the last session and yesterday the fact that, um, particularly at Cambridge, but in some subjects in Oxford, um, women are not doing as well as men, and yet they all must be brilliant when <laughs> they get in, and they're still getting very good degrees, I should say. But have you any thoughts about what could be done there? So I have a few thoughts um, which are becoming um, more relevant day by day. As I'm in Oxford, I'm taking over as chair of the uh, end of first year physics exams, which all physics undergraduates and physics and philosophy undergraduates are required to sit. And there's something of a discrepancy at present with how well males do in those exams versus how well females do. And something I want to look at very carefully is how we phrase questions, how we structure questions, how we introduce questions, because while there are risks, as you alluded to earlier, about drawing out generalities about the different sexes, nonetheless, I think uh, very often females are characterised by being less confident and not having the sense that I can do that. Yes, it's hard, but I can do this. And so I just want to make sure that the way we ask the question, same physics content, no loss of standards in terms of the physics that we're examining it, but are we just being a bit too oblique? Um, and maybe are some of the blokes just crashing through like bulldozers with the confidence of bulldozers? It's something I want to look into, so maybe I can report back in due course when I've uh, got some insights on that. Have you any thoughts there? Y yeah, um, uh, po possibly quite maverick thoughts about this. Um, is passing exams and getting high grades on exams the outcome we're trying to optimise? Um, what I find uh, when I take research students for PhDs is that it's not the people who have got the very high first who are good at research. It's the people who have the two ones and haven't spent all their time cramming for exams, but also have a broad set of interests and are willing to explore things. And so, yes, of course, it is concerning that there's a gender gap, mm. but are the outcomes after they leave university different? That's what I would like to know, like in real careers, in the real world, are they doing worse? Or is it just that exams are not the be all and end all of life? Uh, we are here at university to, to work out how to live our lives, right? Not to pass exams. So, yes, uh, I, I, I'm sure that... Very yes. interesting yes. point. I, I think it's a very profound point because our worth in life, our value in life, is not determined by the number that we get at the end of, of the year or the end of the exam. So I'm fully behind um, your, your maverick approach <laughs> to this. Very much agree with that. Nonetheless, I think if we are inadvertently disadvantaging females from flourishing and being everything they can be, then that's something we have to put right. No, absolutely, yeah, yeah. But, but I would like to see some data on what happens to these people after they leave university. I think that's a really good point. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, now I'm, I would like to um, throw it open to anybody who would like to ask a question. Yes. And again, introduce yourself only if you feel like it. Hi, I'm, I'm Eliza. I'm from Hills Road Sixth Form. Um, something I've picked up on today is that uh, often the case, women to be recognised, you have to be like, exceptional. And that competition is being a, just as good as a man to be kind of seen. And my, uh, my question is about how do you have confidence when... How do you like, keep going with something you know you're passionate about but not being the best, especially in like, a university or kind of college atmosphere? Like, how do you keep having confidence and the motivation to keep going if like when you read <coughs> when you will definitely like sometimes not be the best or when you have drawbacks in education eliza i think that's a fascinating question um i think it is a big mistake in life to try and dance to the beat of someone else's drum you don't have to please other people you do have to, as Hiranya said, choose your path and pursue that. And I would absolutely echo a lot of what you said, that, oh, what if I'm not the best? Well, don't care what other people think. It's perfect is the enemy of good. And good people, using their talents to the full, is what's going to change this world. We do live in an extraordinarily vulnerable time on this particular planet. And the idea that we're missing out on people who can engage in science because of hesitation or because I'm not as good as he is or I'm not as good as she is, the idea that we're missing out is an absolute tragedy. And I think we've got a bigger battle to fight than just more women into science. A key battle that we have got on our hands worldwide is not merely there are not enough women in science, but it's that there is a great big gulf between science and the vast majority of the world. In some of the cultures where I work, um, people, science is really quite alien because they haven't been exposed to it. But magic, and I do mean the darker side of that, is something that they're a bit more familiar with. But actually, even this country, the so many politicians will glory in the fact they don't know any science, that they couldn't diagonalise a matrix. But as Athene Donald said this morning, you know, if we were to stand up saying, <clears throat> I haven't read, read Shakespeare and I'm proud of it, we would be pilloried, and rightly so. So the idea that you're just some narrow boffin, I thoroughly applaud geekiness, thoroughly applaud geekiness, but being a narrow-minded boffin, just hypothesising in the ivory tower, is going to be an absolute disaster for this planet. So forget what other people think. Don't worry about it being hard. Do it anyway. You don't need to be the best. <laughs> you don't need to be the best. You just need to try. Uh, and also, some of these blokes who were the best um, were... Uh, investigating all sorts of absolutely appalling things that it would have been better if they'd been the worst and they'd never <laughs> investigated at all and isn't a, a key idea of getting more women into science and more people from diverse backgrounds into science that it will change science and that we might start investigating the problems of the world, rather than how to make large bombs. Just a suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> An excellent suggestion, if I may say so. Uh, so, um, yeah. It, it, oh, yes, yes. Oh, it's about something else. No, no, yes, carry on. Um, I'm Noam, I'm also from Hills Road. Um, I vaguely gathered from what you said that you've encountered throughout your education and your career some men that didn't really respect your place to be there. And my question is that when you're working with young girls all over the world that are part of the next generation or, and who will grow up, um, hopefully, to be scientists, is there anything you've noticed change or anything? 
I mean, for the worse or for the better, but is there any change you've noticed that you hope can develop? Absolutely. So one thing I would say that I notice above all is the confidence grows. And by the way, it's not just me. My uh, colleague, my Australian colleague, whom you saw uh, briefly at the end of, um, of uh, the little film, um, it actually really matters the way that he speaks to the schoolgirls. And I've been fascinated to watch. So he's Australian, very Australian. And the way that... <laughs> The way that he speaks to these South African schoolgirls or um, schoolgirls, some of whom you saw in rural southern India, as a fellow observer of the night sky is absolutely empowering for them. Because there's, astronomy is a wonderful gateway into science. And, you know, the night sky is apolitical, non-partisan, non-tribal. And I think it, it is very, very levelling indeed. So the sense of confidence that comes with just... Often when you take people from the situation that they're in and you put them into um, an unfamiliar, yet an exciting and an engaging environment, really opens them up and um, helps them to blossom. And when you do put kids into an observatory and say... Go and play with the telescope. Go and explore craters on the moon or whatever it is. Without realising it, without frightening them off, they're doing brilliant imaging physics. They're engaging with technology. They're learning a whole lot about engineering. The, uh, the observatory has to rotate so the telescope can see out. Telescope's doing all sorts of um, uh, 3D geometry. They're just engaging in all of those things, and they see how it fits together. For a lot of humans, seeing is believing and doing is believing. So I think just getting people into a place where they can see themselves doing something new is fantastically empowering and confidence building. I think something that Hiranya and I really have in common <coughs> is just being quite confident about giving things a try, mm -hmm. doing it anyway. And, Haranya mentioned something else which I think is really important. I think you said something like, it doesn't matter if you fail. Mm -hmm. What do we mean by failure? What do we mean by failing? I think true failure is not, not giving true. it a go, not trying. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the idea that failing should be equated with following the wrong lead. I mean, just to go back to detective stories, and at the risk of being Oxford-centric, Morse or Lewis or whatever, <laughs> I love those, um, they follow false leads. They don't ans ask the right question first time, but they chew away at a problem and they persevere and they get there. And I think if, if you're a bit more comfortable with, with that as a paradigm, then maybe pursuing science doesn't seem so hard after all. Just to add to that, uh, to give a different spin on it as well, you, you started your question by saying uh, you, you've intimated that we have encountered some negative attitudes from some men. Well, in my career, uh, I entered a field, cosmology, which was not at all uh, really uh, a place for women when I started. And um, most of the, the support that I got was from men who you know, didn't treat me any different recognized me as a fellow scientist and you know at, in, at an event like this sometimes the negative stories can out, come out and s sound like it's like a, this ubiquitous e experience of, of constant you know negative feedback but that's not the case and I think I'm here today because a lot of men supported me and uh, I think that's really important to to convey it's not it's not always negative. There are very positive things in it. And those positive things allow you to weather the, the experience of a few negative comments by people that you don't care about. Because I don't, I don't think that you, know, you should care too much what other people think. I would really like to underline that. Don't become anti-men. Because most people, the, the people who are tiresome and tedious and behave in a reprehensibly a bad way are in the minority. That's not to say when things happen, 
they aren't thoroughly objectionable and awful, and that's where good friends come in. But most people want to help. Most people want to be collegial. I'm a card-carrying member of the Owen Saxton fan club, <laughs> as is Kate <laughs> Isaac. <laughs> and I think people who do instill confidence in you and do guide you and encourage you, you know, spend time with them. And the tedious ones, give them a wide berth. Thank you. Um, any more questions? Yes, a man. <laughs> well, um, you said earlier that uh, failure is often not a, not a disaster. Now, there are some instances where failing by one little bit can actually, if not be a disaster in life, then certainly be a disaster for a scientific career. If instead of that 2-1, you actually manage to get a 2-2, two, two, because on the day you didn't really quite feel like, like it, forget it, PhD, at least in Cambridge. And I know people to whom that has happened. They have recovered from it. In fact, they went into your profession you probably know as well as, as I do who I'm talking about, who got a 2-2 and had to go, I think, somewhere in, else in England to get a PhD and uh, had to go to America to make a career out of it. And is now still on the American continent being a professor. Uh, but it does have an effect. Now, I think you're absolutely right that in the wider world, you got a Cambridge degree, nobody actually asked, and nobody would know the difference, what the grade is. But within this particular environment, these things are important. And I think they're sometimes a little bit too important. I don't equate not doing a PhD with failure. <laughs> <laughs> if your intention is to become an academic, and we are talking about what are the mm. thresholds that keep people away from making that next step, Sure but, the pipeline. sure, but disappointments are part of life and they're not just conf confined to the academic path we may or may not be on. The marigolds didn't flower this year. It's a disappointment. Now, I wouldn't dream of equating that with the disappointment of not following your first career path. But there isn't only one route to success in, yeah. in life in general <coughs> or in academia in particular. And sometimes different experiences that we go through turn out to be, later on, with the benefit of hindsight, mm -hmm. extraordinarily beneficial and enriching. Well, nearly, I think, every highly successful person who I have ever interviewed had a great failure or a great setback. I've interviewed Nelson Mandela. He went to prison for a long yeah. time, and then he saved South Africa. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I, I think failure is part of life. Um, now, we're coming near to the end. Has anybody else got a question that they would like to ask? Yes. Hey, I'm Eva. I'm a recent MPhil grad from Edwards. Um, just on the, to continue on, you know, the loudmouth men that kind of put you down and stuff. So you, I think that it is possible to get confidence to sort of dismiss it the further on you go, you can feel like, okay, who cares? But I think one of the problems that I see a lot of uh, women facing is the men that suck and are in positions of power over us. So like I know two different women who had to drop out of their PhDs because of like sexual harassment or misogyny and bullying. Um, and I think that that's where, and I mean like with my situation, I had a great supervisor, but at one of our um, like MPhil uh, presentations, we had a very high up man throw a public tantrum, and everyone you know everyone was disturbed. Everyone like in my department is lovely with lectures and stuff, but this man had a tantrum and doesn't matter. And then like the person he had a, the student he had a tantrum at, now he's like his career is kind of in limbo because he's meant to do a PhD under this man. So I'm just wondering like what of those. <laughs> 
men that are, you know, have been holding on to these positions mm -hmm. of power for so long with no consequence? Uh, I think you raise a, a really important question. And, you know, often we, we um, hear that, the, okay, the, the questions about, you know, what you do when you encounter a situation, it can be like, oh, you know, you as an individual try to navigate it as best as you can. I don't think that's going to work. Um, so bullying and harassment is a systemic issue. It needs to be tackled by organizations um, at the level of the system, uh, not by individuals somehow standing up to power dynamics or by getting somebody to talk to that, that person. And so I think it's very, very important for institutions to develop policies that work and enact them when things go wrong and create a uh, environment in which people feel empowered to report things that are happening to them and to see consequences happening to the perpetrator. Um, I think that's very, very important. Um, and I, I hope this university uh, has those policies. I, I'm newly arrived, but um, I'm, I'm hoping that those policies are in place and that um, PhD students are not having these kinds of experiences, but it sounds like they are. Well, yesterday Val Gibson said that she is promoting the idea of Cambridge having an ombudsperson um, because the systems are not working uh, properly. And I thought that was one of the most interesting ideas to come out of this and immediately thought that um, uh, that was something that, as a college, we should support. I was shocked when I came here, having come from TV, which you all know is bad, um, to hear um, a, a story like that from a student. Um, and I did offer to go around and kill the man. Um, <laughs> but uh, she had to just give me his name. And I, 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 obviously, I, I would only have destroyed him not actually a murder. <laughs> but it, 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 it really interested me that she said, the problem is he is the only person who can supervise me. Yes. And if he doesn't supervise me, there, there isn't somebody else in Cambridge who can supervise me. And that, it, uh, uh, for that, or so she felt, and that um, was uh, an extraordinary level of power for a person to have. I agree very much with what you've both said. I think it's extremely important to recognise problems you can't solve on your own. I really encourage you not to get bogged down in the low level stuff. Don't sweat the small stuff. It's tedious. Look forwards. But the big stuff, which does happen occasionally, you absolutely have to get help. And either you get help from a fantastically supportive head of college, maybe tempering things back a bit if she's <laughs> offering to kill the individual. <laughs> um, I think Karanya is very wise when she suggests um, that you need policies and structures mm. to help. If ever you end up being in a situation where you yourself or others with whom you are talking are in one of the awful situations, don't dismiss that. That is not something to be swept away as the noise, as the trivia. That's a big deal. And you have to work out, just extend your tendrils, work out who are the people to talk to. Do so carefully because there could be all sorts of connections you don't know about, but don't give up. Do not give up, this really matters. Find someone who you can tell they really care about the well-being of everybody, not just of the big bullies with big boots on. Well, I, I, you know, every university should be a supportive uh, environment and has a legal duty towards people to support them and no one should ever feel that it, it's their job, it's the job of the institution to protect the students and the staff in it. So that is, a, that's actually a positive thought to end on, that it's not, um, it's not the duty of an individual to save 
an institution, it's the duty of the institution to save itself. But may I say, uh, you have been truly inspiring and you haven't made me feel for a moment that it was a problem that I don't know very much about astrophysics, but now you've made me want to know all about it. Maybe I'll come to Murray Edwards and do a degree. <laughs> um, so um, uh, may I ask you all to uh, thank our speaker. <laughs>